name is Melissa Lanafi, and I'm a tour guide and historian here in Sligo. I'm delighted to be taking part in the St Patrick's Festival this year. We're here beside the Garavogue River that flows from Loch Gill through the town and out into Sligo Bay and the wide Atlantic. Garavogue, it's Irish, it means young rough and originally the river was quite wild and rough in appearance until the 19th century when a merchant named Abraham Martin dug up the riverbed and carted all the rocks and stones down to his estate at Cleavera. He created two lake follies that you can still see today. In the 19th century, Victorian tourists visiting Sligo will come down here to the riverside and take boats out or have a boatman row them up the river to visit the islands and the Hazelwood estate. Hazelwood House is an 18th century Palladian style country house. Hazelwood was owned by the Wynne family, they were local landlords. And when distinguished visitors and the gentry would visit Sligo, they would stay in Hazelwood House and be entertained by Owen Wynne. Now, Owen Wynne became a Member of Parliament in the Irish Parliament in 1749 and he moved to Dublin and he had a townhouse on Henrietta Street. And when he was thrown a, a dinner party, he wanted to impress his guests, so he would send for oysters and salmon from his estate and his housekeeper, Mrs Martin, she would pickle salmon in kegs of spices, wine and vinegar and she would send them up. And at one time they sent 600 oysters up to Dublin for one of his dinner parties. Along the riverside here, there was originally a distillery and it was owned and run by Abraham Martin. Now, uh, Abraham Martin's whiskey, it was known as Sligo whiskey or Martin's whiskey and it became very popular in 1821 when King George IV visited Ireland. And it was said that he sampled Martin's whiskey on the ship. And when he arrived, um, he declared that it was the most potent and finest whiskey that he had ever drank. Um, now, it was said that he had uh, abundantly enjoyed goose pie and uh, Irish whiskey on the ship. And he declared on arrival that his heart was Irish and it was the happiest day of his life. Now, this was only three weeks after his coronation, so he was riding high. But it was actually only five days after his wife, Caroline of Brunswick, had died. Um, but they had been estranged for many years. Now, another reason why he was probably quite ecstatic to be here was that he was planning on visiting his, uh, his mistress, the Marchioness Lady Cunningham of Slane Castle. There's an old fable which states St. Patrick met two fishermen on the Garavogue River and asked them for a salmon. This fisherman explained that there was no salmon here in the winter months. However, they cast their nets and to their surprise, they caught one. They presented it to St. Patrick and in return, he is said to have blessed the river with salmon all year round. We are at the old prison walls of Sligo Gael. The prison was constructed by the local builder John Lane in 1818, costing £22,000. The prison could hold 160 prisoners with 91 cells and 21 rooms with beds. On this six acre site there was a governor's house in the middle, a male and female wing, an infirmary, a debtor's prison, a chapel and a school as children were also imprisoned here. At the height of the famine, there was 291 men, women and children imprisoned here, the highest number ever recorded. In 1823, a treadmill was installed. This was a form of hard labour and punishment. The treadmill was invented by a man called William Covet. He was an English engineer and he came from a family of millwrights, so that's where he got the idea. Here in Sligo, the treadmill had a second purpose. It was used to pump water up from the Garvogue, which was used for uh, fresh drinking water and it kept the sewers flushed. Public execution by hanging took place outside the prison gates here. And these were usually done on a market day as they wanted to attract a large crowd. And some people viewed it as a, a form of entertainment. Now by the 1860s though, the public executions, uh, these were moved inside the prison walls. In the late 19th century, there was many political prisoners imprisoned here, including Michael Davitt. And during the revolutionary years, the big fella himself, Michael Collins, was imprisoned here in 1918. He wrote in his diary that he could see the top of Nocturne Mountain from his prison cell. There were several successful prison breaks made at that time, with one rescue being made with the aid of rope ladders thrown over the 25-foot prison walls. 
Finally, in 1956, after 138 years, the prison gates closed for the last time. In 1252, the Commons of the Holy Priory was presented to the Dominican Order by the Norman Baron and the Chief Justice of Ireland, Maurice Fitzgerald. Though known locally as the Abbey, it is in fact a Dominican Priory. Sligo Abbey has been burnt down twice, in 1414 when a candle was left unattended and then in 1642 when Sir Frederick Hamilton ordered his soldiers to burn the Friary down. In Sligo we love a good parade and the St Patrick's Day parade has been running for many years but even before that we made a parade out of the laying of a foundation stone. In 1898 a club was established to commemorate the 1798 Irish Rebellion. It was decided a memorial would be erected in the centre of town. The Dublin sculptor Herbert G Barron's design was chosen. On the 8th of October 1898 thousands of people thronged into the town. The streets were decorated with banners and national emblem flags flew from the taller buildings in the town. All the main streets were decorated with arches of evergreens. And Miss Ruby Ferguson of the Ferguson Theatre posed as Lady Erin, dressed in green and white and playing the harp. While a Mr T W Carew of Strand Hill arrived on horseback wearing the uniform of a Lieutenant of the United States Army to act as a parade marshal. The parade was headed by the Sligo Temperance Band with the Mayor of Sligo, P.A. McHugh, and members of the corporation following behind on a wagonette. Ten months later, on the 3rd of September 1899, the Lady of Erin statue was finally unveiled with another street procession with marching bands and the new Mayor, E.J. Tide, on an open carriage. The statue sits on a limestone pillar and is 16 foot high and is made of Sicilian marble. In her left hand, she carries a flag with the figures 1798 and a harp and a cross on it, while her right hand is raised in a sign of rebellion. She wears a Phrygian cap, which is a symbol of liberty. Underneath her feet, there are broken chains, which is a symbol of the chains of bondage being uh, broken. The Cathedral of St John's is believed to have been built on the site of an Anglo-Norman hospital. A medieval hospital was a type of shelter for the sick and elderly and for pilgrims. The church which stands today was designed by the German architect Richard Castles. He also designed Hazelwood House, the Rotunda and Leinster House. In 1832 the cholera epidemic spread to Sligo. Cholera is an infectious disease which attacks the body's intestinal system and often proved fatal in the 19th century. 14-year-old Charlotte Thorny lives on Old Market Street with her family and witnessed the devastating effects of the epidemic on the town. 
She lived next to the old courthouse, which was turned into a coffin making workshop. Many of the victims of cholera succumbed in a matter of hours and were buried here in St John's graveyard and at the Abbey and also in the cholera fields behind the fever hospital in the town. Later on in life, Charlotte told her children about the horrifying events that had occurred in Sligo during the cholera epidemic. She wrote an account of it and sent it to her son, the author Bram Stoker. He used it as inspiration in short stories and in his famous novel, Dracula. Markbridge Road, originally called Victoria Road after Queen Victoria, was built on reclaimed land in the 1850s. A bronze statue of the poet W. B. Yeats with the words of his poetry wrapped around his body stands outside the classical Renaissance bank building. A few doors down, the traditional Irish pub front of Thomas Connolly's remains largely unchanged since it was first licensed in 1861 to a Mr. Hennigan. This pub was originally a shebeen and dates back to the 1780s with the entrance on Holborn Street. Thomas Connolly made his money on the American railroads in the 1880s and returned home and bought this pub in 1890. Charles Stuart Purnell attended a civic reception in support of Connolly who successfully ran for mayor in the same year. In the 19th century, the port of Sligo was a busy place, with emigrants departing and local dockers unloading cargo from ships, and sailors from England and Europe docked in the port, calling into the pub here for a rum and black. in the world this St. Patrick's. I hope you have a good one. Enjoy!